Alright, cool. <clears throat> Not stuck. I affirm resolve. The United States also substantially reduced its military presence in the West Asia and North Africa region. The Department of Defense defined substantially reduce as a funding quality of decreased 50% or more. And according to Professor Zhang Jinghong, military presence is the establishment of military bases with direct involvement in domestic conflicts in one sovereign nation by another. I value justified state action, defined as ethically permissible governmental conduct. All states have an equal claim to sovereignty, and no one has the authority to police others. A single power dominating the political sphere would marginalize other voices. Constitutional scholars Lisa James et al. write, checks limit the the power of majority to act without regard to the others. They ensure those in the minority are represented. This helps improve the quality of decision making and prevent behavior which might threaten the political system. Thus, my criterion is preserving checks on state power. Preserving checks on state power means maintaining constraints on how governments treat other states and this measure to extend the standard qualitatively but not quantitatively. The question isn't how many checks exist but how they work to stop unwarranted state action. My thesis is that America should act as a nation, not an empire. Since the U.S. military presence, abbreviated USMP, hinders countries in state of helping them, it is unjustifiably unchecked in its routines and results. My first contention is the harms to one of. Post 9-11, the United States military presence in the West Asia North African region kicked into high gear and it was based in Islamophobia, not genuine security needs. Professor Khalid Beydoun proves that in the wake of 9-11, a new kind of war eroded modern internationalism. Bush drew a clear line between civilization and Islam and activated the U.S. global war machine, fixating unchecked violence on vulnerable Muslim populations. The war on terror extended the position of the United States, assumed the global police. In Iraq, the United States waged war without evidence of terror threat, instructing the world that you are either with us or against us. A state that refused to comply would be sanctioned. This threatened, uh, this threat demanded U.S. military intervention in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Muslim-majority nations beyond and in between, all linked by the presumption of terrorism. And this has had deadly consequences. Brown University's Watson Institute reports that over 432,000 civilians have died as a direct result of the U.S. post-9-11 wars. In West Asia North Africa, the total death toll is at least 4.5 to 4.7 million and counting and more than 7.6 million children under 5 in post-9-11 war zones suffer from acute malnutrition. Worse, the promise of protection is empty and a ruse. The U.S. forces want a state to depend on its, on, on its violence by retaliating if they try to break free. Professor Maji Shalati shows that West Asian North Africa states depend on imperial states and the dream of Arab unity has been shattered by attacks from petrodollar states, especially the United States, and their increase in role in regions spread throughout the patronage system. Any attempt to break free from Western hegemony has been faced with attacks by Western countries. The result is that today, no one state or one region could be described as stable and because of Western intervention. It disrupted life in the region, displaced millions, and destroyed infrastructure. Further, U.S. military presence in the West Asian North African region is plagued by corruption, denying internal checks on the United States as well. Professor Jordi Vittori notes that from 2001 to 6, 31% of companies believe corruption was a decisive factor in allocation of contracts. Large pools of money and little oversight make defense industry especially ripe for corruption, exacerbated when purchasing countries are unaccountable for and generally in the case throughout the Middle East. East North African region. She, she adds that characteristics of U.S. government exports in the sector are intertwined with influence vis-a-vis -vis government for the Middle East. Extensive lobbying and campaign contributions prevent reforms and are unfavorable for the industry, and access to officials' insider knowledge rather than expertise leads to hiring decisions in national security. In 2018 alone, there were at least 645 instances where top 20 defense contractors hired former government officials, military officers, or senior executives. Thus, reducing U.S. military presence is the only way to check unjustified impunity materialism. And my second contention is that United States military presence breeds backlash. It yields unchecked and unjust results. U.S. military presence backfires. Efforts to protect the state are the number one cause of terrorism. Professor Paul Pilar et al. shows that the foremost driver of anti-U.S. terrorism has been U.S. military presence. The Middle East provides numerous examples of Hezbollah's anti-U.S. sanctions. The bombing of Saudi Arabia, the origins of Al-Qaeda, lie in resentments over U.S. military presence. United States military buildup in Saudi Arabia, more than any other single development, radicalized been Laden. The single most important step the U.S. can take to reduce terrorism is to draw down its military presence in the Middle East. Further, this locks in cycles of violence. The U.S. military presence brings about instability and thus more militarism. It's an ongoing process that fuels itself. Foreign policy expert John Glazer writes that the presence of U.S. military antagonizes opponents who otherwise would have been docile, heightening instability and entangling the United States in peripheral conflicts. 
forward deployed forces tempt intervention where the U.S. interests are not at stake. He adds U.S. troops abroad are more, are more vulnerable to attack them and forces at home. If Israel were to strike one of Iran's nuclear facilities, the United States would be, Im, uh, would be implicated immediately because of the promise to fight and defend Israel. In the Middle East, the risk of terrorist attacks on military bases has increased and anti-American narrative has become even more popular, making U.S. bases a desirable target. Infamous examples like the bombings in Beirut killed 241 Americans and the Al-Qaeda attack off the coast of Yemen are illustrative that bases can motivate attacks on U.S. soil. And, in contrast, affirming opens the door to diplomacy instead of death and collaboration, not colonialism. But here, Kamuri of the University of Pennsylvania shows that the U.S. must engage with the Middle East as the Middle East would like to be engaged. The U.S. should pursue serious diplomatic engagement through investment and economic cooperation within the region. Credible technology and energy alternatives drive free trade agreements and promote trade partnerships and investment in the Gulf ventures. Diplomacy in the Middle East can succeed when America's past military interventions have failed. In fact, pursuing diplomacy resolves the root cause of the conflict in general, which proves military presence is unnecessary. Policy expert Tamara uh, Witz writes that the United States must rebuild its most effective tool in the Middle East, diplomacy, especially in conflict resolution. In Yemen and Libya, there might now be opportunities to pull competing regional powers out of fighting and negotiate power-sharing governments to promote stability and reduce terrorist movements. By valid communication over coercion, uh, I affirm and stand ready for cross. Cool. <clears throat> Cool, starting now. What constitutes a justified state action? A justified state action? Sure. Uh, an argument under the framework would be uh, an action that promotes the rights of individuals carried out by the United States federal government. What are those rights? Who determines what they are? Who determines what rights are? Yeah. Sure. I guess it's, <clears throat> I mean, it's up to individuals within the state. That's what the, like, the Lisa James at all evidence says, that everyone has an equal claim to sovereignty, so it's something that respects someone's personhood, i.e. their individual liberty, their access to goods and services needed to survive, and their ability, uh, I don't know, their freedom of, of like, expression within a state. So what constitutes as violating someone's sovereignty or violating a state's sovereignty? If a state is violating the sovereignty of its own people, does the United St is it justified for the United States to interfere? No, because the argument is that intervention within the state is the issue, and the United States makes things worse. I.e., like, we give you numerous examples. Libya and Yemen started with domestic disputes, and then the United States came in to introduce democracy and just made it an absolute disaster, and now Libya and Yemen are, like, I understand are, like, that, but in, the, but in the past, throughout history, uh, for example, when uh, Russia, Russia and, um, and other countries in the West were fighting Nazi Germany, they had to... Intervene, intervene with what Nazi Germany was doing in their own country. So would that be unjustified? Because they were technically violating the sovereignty of Germany. Uh, I mean, sure. The argument is that uh, the United States violates the rights of civilians. This is a key difference from World War II because the United States was actively protecting people, uh, I guess, from the Holocaust in that case. Mm -hmm. This is more specific because the United States is uh, supporting, like, actions that cause the death of innocent people, i.e. they are giving missiles to Saudi Arabia that they then drop on Yemeni school children. It's like, it's a, it's a complete, a different situation. That's fine. Um, yeah, on, on, your, on your second contention, uh, locking back styles and violence, what are you referring to? Are you referring to terrorism? Are you referring to wars? What is Cycles the of violence? Contention? It's just like the military industrial complex. Like, they, there will always be a war in the, in like, in the Middle East, right? Like, there's, constant domestic disputes, like civil wars, the United States will just continuously uh, send like pr PMCs or they will send, uh, you know, like p p their own presence into the region and perpetuate said wars and t and like uh, cause cycles of violence, cycles okay. of war. Basically. I guess if the United States has an obsession with causing violence in the Middle East, why wouldn't they just find other ways outside of military presence, i.e. like coercive have. diplomacy? They have. The argument is that the United States has always had, like, an influence. They've, they've been involved in, like, lobbying in those countries. So why countries. does one policy just solve all, an, an entire history if, of coercion? If we eliminate presence, then the argument is that Middle Eastern states have proper self-determination. Because, like, a lot of what happens in the Middle East is as a result of, like, like basing in military presence. I guess. I'll be taking running prep. Okay.
I have five. Two ten left. Uh, orders NC AC. AC just starting on framing. I just don't go. Did you send the? Uh, I'm about to. Okay. I negate the resolution resolve. The United States also substantially decreased its military presence in the West Asia North Africa region. Conceding the value of justice. Pleasure is an intrinsic good. Moment 16. Empirically, pleasure is valuable and pain is disvaluable. There is something undeniably good about pleasure. I might inquire why is buying the soda good for? You might ask, I want for the pleasure of drinking it. We never ask what the end is because we assume that pleasure in, in itself is worthy. Consequentialism is true. All actions are forward looking, so intentions are constituted by foreign consequences. Thus, the standard is, ma is maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. Calc and don't link my firm because a general principle to be implied intuitively, not a rigid calculator. Prefer. Extinction outweighs. Number 15. Deontologists, virtue ethics, all agree we should try and save the world. There are trillions upon trillions of future people. Non-consequentialism is not the view that the latter don't matter. Plausible virtues m might be concerned in part with promoting good. It matters even if there are 1% assurance that the well-being matters from the standpoint of uncertainty. Reducing existential risk is the most important thing. Contention 1 is a salamia. Continued U.S. presence in Salamia is needed to combat Al-Shabaab. Now is key. Phillips 27. Salamia, Al-Shabaab went too far. Shot a clan elder, dragging Logan teens into their ranks of suicide bombers. Tax murders is set off a chain of events that has given the United States the upper hand in a 16-year campaign. Now Salamia has became a surprising bright spot in the global battle pitting the West. Against insurgents used terror. Militiamen took up arms in a spontaneous uprising. Salamia government forces led by American trade commandos joined the fray. Somali troops, backed by American drones, drove Al-Shabaab out of 20, 20 towns and 80 villages. Fighting has been fierce. Government strategists plan to renew attacks. Salamia offers a whiff of success against a backdrop of failure. Al-Shabaab is able. Intentionally kills civilians, uses child soldiers, and attacks humanitarian resources. Turns the affirmative. A deadly temp. The role of these armed groups on the war for civilians has been extraordinarily negative. Accountability for civilian protection has been largely ignored. Al-Shabaab has been particularly brazen in its use of civilians as human shields. Recruiting children, suicide missions, attacking civilian areas, exacting extreme forms of penalties for minor offenses, attacking humanitarian workers, and imposing restrictions on humanitarian access. Contention 2 is has built deterrence. Tensions high now, major shift among major players triggers domino effect, but U.S. military deterrence is working on Hezbollah, Washington, D.C., 23. The United States boasted its military deterrence as the, as, as the Israeli war on Gaza escalated. Bolstering presence to deter a water war by sending a message to Hezbollah not to get involved against Israel, which is likely to respond by invading Lebanon. The prospects of a wider war are ever-present. U.S., remember that the 34-day war causing much destruction, a two-front war for Israel, would widen the conflict, bringing further destabilization to Lebanon. Hassan Nasrallah stated all options were on the table. Enhanced U.S. military presence is working as a deterrent. And Israel Hamas war has created unstable nuclear security. Both sides lack motivation currently and opportunity to proliferate. Her 23. Conflict between Israel and Hamas complicated nuclear dynamics. Israel possesses nuclear weapons, Iran is advancing its nuclear program, and Saudi Arabia is developing a nuclear deterrent if Iran attains one. Iran's support for Hamas strained relationship with Israel. Iran now has enough, uh, enough, Iran now has enough fissile material to make nuclear bombs. Fissile break time measured in weeks or less. Diplomatic attempts to slow Iran's nuclear ambitions have faced challenges. Iran is a major player. Israeli officials have emphasized the refusal to accept a nuclear armed adversary and have shown minimal interest in nuclear diplomacy. Iran is on the blank of Rolif now. Hezbollah attacks give Iran the perfect window. Israel is too focused on Hamas. Shikar 23. Iran may seek to exploit Israel's preoccupation with Hamas to break out of its non-proliferation obligations and direct its proxies to open new fronts against Israel. Biden has a special responsibility to deter Iran from nuclear weapons. Iran now possesses uranium to fuel 10 nuclear weapons, 12 days to produce the first weapon, 4 months to produce 10. Jerusalem is focused on Hamas and guarding against being 
pulled into additional Iran-backed forces. America may need to step in and act military on Israel's behalf. Tehran will be looking to establish nuclear deterrent and to annihilate the Jewish state. Israel, prolif causes, Israel proliferation causes nuclear war. Fudder 21. A nuclear-armed Iran could cause other nations to develop nuclear weapons. Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Turkey, Egypt. If Iran is able to acquire nuclear weapons, it will fundamentally undermine the national non-proliferation regime. An emboldened Iran could lead to a regional instability. An unstable Iranian-Israeli nuclear contest would emerge. Even one dead nation causes extinction. Over 19. But just one nuclear war it could do is unimaginable. Firestorms combined with high altitude debris would reduce sunlight for decades causing drought, winter, global famine, and catastrophic impacts for all life due to the intense UAV with the destruction of the ozone layer. With this in mind, let's look to the affirmative case. First, on the framework of, ju of justified state action. One, there's no bright line about what justified state action means because what, is ju what is justified in one area would not be justified in another area. Sovereignty is not the end-all be-all. The only reason why some state actions are better than other state actions is because it, because it collapses to the general principle of, mi of maximizing pain for people and minimizing pain for people. Therefore, you should just prefer it because our framework, their framework collapses to ours. On their first contention about Islamophobia, terrorists and on, on, on Islamophobia, the first response is one: is terrorists and the instability is already present, meaning there's no reason why just remove is already present, meaning there's no reason why removing military presence will be able to solve for it. It's an ongoing issue. Israel literally just stated that they are willing to perpetuate this war for several months with the with goal of destro destroying Hamas. There's no reason why they were able to solve for the continued human rights violations. Independently, these the, in, independently. Other major world powers, such as China and Russia, have large interests in this area. China already has been expanding the BRI, and Russia is already the major political force in Syria. Meaning, if the United States were to pull out, this would obviously lead to Russia and China pulling in and perpetuating many of the impacts that the YSC talks about. The second contention is, the second contention is about like diplomacy and that military mis mispresence backfires. One is that these powers already hate these powers already hate the U.S., so there's no reason why they would be able to solve for that root cause of the problem. Two is that there's alternative causes to many other widespread issues. There's no reason. There's no reason why the United States military presence is uniquely key to the instability in the region. Third is that they say that diplomacy will happen. Diplomacy can solve for all the issues. But if you but if you listen to the entirety of the one AC, the entirety of one AC, particularly the first contention, is premised on the fact that United States action in the area has been negative. Colonial co colonial dominance in the area has led to many unnecessary impacts that have caused widespread violence. So therefore, if the United States would just do diplomacy in the region, that would just perpetuate many of the same impacts that they are talking about. Whether that be whether that would be like coercive economic measures or other policies that would that would find a way to perpetuate the impacts. Independently, they also mentioned uh, private military corporations that are already in that are already in the area, and they would also perpetuate many of the impacts. Overall, uh, the the uh, one, the one AC just isn't able to solve a lot of its effects because one, there's alternative causes to those impacts, and two, there's no reason why one policy is able to overcome an entire history of colonial governments and violence. For those reasons, I negate. Okay, uh, good for Cross. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, um, I'll start. Uh, you say in the 1NC that Iran already has nuclear material to build a bomb, why haven't they? Because they haven't had the motivation to, nor the opportunity, and they're currently in agreement that says that they shouldn't. Okay, what's the uh, internal link to like that the destruction of that agreement? Sure, we're basically saying that um, re removal from military presence leads to Hezbollah opening a wider front against Israel. Right now, it's just small attacks. Okay. Uh, that leads to a wider front, and that gives Iran the distraction and the and the opportunity to break out of that agreement. Uh, Sure. What's why? Where's the explicit link to U.S. military presence? Uh, like allowing them to stay in the agreement. Like, why is the U.S. key? That's not the argument that we're making. Then how does this negate? Sure. We're the how argument. Does the, how does how does the impact? How does the AF trigger your impact if you're not winning a warrant for why the United States is key to prevent extinction, to prevent Iran from going nuclear? We have war. a warrant. We're saying is that. The United States is key to the United States is key to deterring Hezbollah, and that triggers the nuclear scenario that we've talked about. Okay, sure. Uh, what does the Hezbollah conflict look like in Iran right now? In Iran? Yeah. Like, I, how does it affect Iran? That's what I mean. I mean, sure. the The general premise is that Hezbollah, in many ways, functions as a vanguard party, quote unquote, to to Iran, and they function within Lebanon. They are the militia. They are the Government of Lebanon slash a private militia in right. Lebanon. Okay. It's complicated. Yeah, I get that it's complicated, but my question is, 
Why is Hezbollah uh, increasing like their weapons capabilities affect what Iran does? Sure, because Iran has motivations. They don't like the state of Israel. They have the hate for the state of Israel. So what we're saying is that that innate like this this dislike for the state of Israel. Great. Using lightly. Why is the United States key? Like again, like I, I don't like sure. Iran hates Israel. Iran wants to nuke Israel. Why is the United States? Uh, enough to stop that now, and why does production of presidents mean that Iran will change their mind? Because, the, because we've read a clear, the claim, the second evidence read, the the Horshik evidence states that Hezbollah opening a wider front on Israel when the United States pulls out gives Iran the opportunity to like proliferate nuclear weapons. You said that Iran already has the capability to proliferate. Also, what's the time frame for proliferation? And why is Iran incentivized to drop a nuke on a U.S. ally when they'll get blown to smithereens as, a re as like, a response? Because Iran, in many ways, is not exactly a rational actor. Okay, you're a, a high school student who did enough research to prove that, like, Iran gets all pissed off. Why isn't the Iranian government smart enough to realize that they'll get cooked if they drop a nuke? I don't know. Why don't you walk up to an accident? It's a long walk, bro. Um... <laughs> Uh, case, how is your framing measurable, I guess? Sure, we say that pain and pleasure are, val are valuable. We say, like, government action, trying to measure pain is, like, like, in the individual people, getting, like, a mathematical measure is, like, irrelevant. We say you can observe when pain is being created. Sure. Uh, prep. There. Minute 45 left. Um, there's like new 1AR cards. I mean, I guess you, you want those. Yes. All right. Order's going to be the F, uh, the F starting with like just like contention one, contention two, um, the framework, and then the, the two neg contentions. <coughs> I have it, let's just let me down with it. All right. <coughs> All right, you're good. Okay. Uh, wait, you're good. All right, so. 
As an overview to the round, you should vote affirmative because we give you statistics and the negative gives you gives you mere speculation. The F outweighs all of the 1 and C simply on strength of link and logic. Start with our first contention. Look back to our evidence from Beidoun that says that post 9-11, US military presence has kicked into high gear and is based on Islamophobia which perpetuates harm. They've conceded numerous examples of how that leads to deaths of civilians. 432,000 civilians have died and 4.7 million and counting have already died in total after 2001. That outweighs is the negative because their arguments are it outweighs the negative on probability because we have real statistics that prove that death is happening as a result of military presence versus speculation of Iran war and that's basically conceded. They say that terrorism and instability is already present but ask yourself why. Look back to contention 2 that says that terrorism and instability are only the cause of the United States because countries in the Middle East are very anti-United States so they only add fuel to the flame. They also say that other powers like China and Russia will fill in but that's non-unique because Chinese and Russian forces are already in the Middle East. They literally state it themselves. Russia is already in Syria right now, and China is already in Saudi Arabia. The United States only makes it worse, the, which which increases the harm. And U.S. military pleasant, uh, presence causes corruption in general, which decreases democratic stability and only in, increases and maximizes the risk of harm in general, which outweighs the negative, the contention too. We'll go over their answers really quick. They say that that, that, that like there are numerous alt causes and that and that there's no reason why like the U.S. military reduction is key. But they've conceded our solvency evidence that says that affirming opens the door to diplomacy instead of things like death and war, and that affirming is the only way to take responsibility for the harms and atrocities that happen in the Middle East. The only reason why harms that exist so badly right now is because the states in the Middle East backlash against the United States. That's conceded out of contention too, which independently turns all of the negative because their arguments are contingent upon conflict that exists right now, but the United States is the root cause, so the affirmative solves, and you should err heavily affirmative. The, uh, onto the negative case. We'll start with the overall framing and their framing of, of utilitarianism and maximizing expected well-being. One, you should prefer maintaining a system of checks. They've conceded the warrants in the affirmative for why maintaining checks is good, but also the biggest problem with utilitarianism is that it doesn't, is that, it, is that it's, it's one, an amoral theory, and second, not an action. Utilitarianism and maximizing well-being isn't an action that states can take. Meanwhile, maximizing checks on government is a key action and a process, which means that you should prefer it on specificity, and it's easier to link into the, uh, the contentions. First, contention one, the Somalia example. The Somalia is not North Africa. U.S. Department of State notes that Somalia is located on the east coast of Africa and is referred to as the Horn of Africa. It's part of the Horn of African region and it's and it's East African. Second, it's non-unique. Their evidence literally says that the fighting has been fierce between the United States and terrorist groups. That doesn't justify why U.S. military presence is good. It only justifies why U.S. military presence beats terrorists. It doesn't prove that it maximizes rights or minimizes harm in general since genocide is really bad in Somalia right now. The contention to First, frame frame this contention on a, through the guise of probability that a lot of their evidence is several years old and isn't and isn't warranted. They are missing an internal link as to why the United States is key to prevent Iran proliferation because this happens on its own. But anyway, there is no war or or there is no Iran war. Tomlinov one nineteen says that Russia and China have little desire to get into an unprecedented conflict. Despite talk of World War Three, they can only count on themselves. Russia benefits from isolation. Iran, Beijing, and Moscow have no appetite. That means no war, and there's no impact to the second contention. But second. And the affirmative turns this back. The app controls the root cause. This is how you should frame your ballot, and this is the most important thing you should circle on your flow. The reason why tensions are increasing is because the United States has started stuff in Israel, and it is now th and it has now caused harm. But there is also no Middle East war. Iran Ron 19 notes the international seminar on conflicts that the Middle East participated. International scholars argue that there will be no war in the first place. They are also not winning a time frame or link. Nuclear war caused extinction. Sure. How do we get to nuclear war? Anyone's guess.
is going to be the aft and then the neck with framing at the top. First on the framing on the framing debate, they made two responses to utilitarianism. The first is the first is to say that utilitarianism is a moral theory, but but I did not catch a, f a warrant for why this is true. There's no warrant why utilitarianism is an immoral theory coming out of the one year, so you should just reject this argument right off the flow. Second, they said that utilitarianism is not an action that states can take. Yes, utilitarianism is an action that state can take. Minimizing 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 the pain of the people in your country and maximizing the and max and maximizing the well being of the of the people in your country is definitely an action that you can take. Independently, there are just a few warrants for or why you should just for you should prefer you should you, you should, why you should prefer you should prefer state action one is to concede that their framework collapses to ours because the only reason why you care about justified state action is because it prevents the harms that it prevents the harms such as war such as death such as all of the impacts that we have discussed in this round meaning that preventing those impacts on a direct level is the most important impact in this round second is that you can see that extinction outweighs there are an infinite number of future generations they might make a larger framing issue about like we need to we need to address smaller material claims that are happening right now but the reality is, is that extension forecloses the ability for us to make any sort of claims or make sort of any changes about any of the impacts that you were discussing. Meaning that meaning that extinction has to be the first and only impact that means that has to be the first impact that you evaluate on your ballot. If we win that the one AC has a one percent risk of, of triggering an existential risk, then that would then that should be that then that should be efficient to sign your ballot. So that should be sufficient to sign your ballot affirmative. With this in, to sign your ballot negative, excuse me. With this in mind, let's move on to the affirmative case. There are a few responses on there, there's a couple of responses on the affirmative case that just were not at, that were just not adequately answered. One is the root cause debate. They they made this clear claim in the one year that this is a, a critical claim. The the problem is that they've missed a critical uniqueness claim. The terrorists that the United States action that you're saying has triggering are already there and they are already present in the region. Therefore, the United States military is needed to deter the te the terrorists, as we have said in the contention. There's no there's no reason why pulling out just means that the terrorists just are not going to exist independently a long history of United States interference in the area means that the means that the that the anti-American sentiment that is currently prevalent in the Middle East is going to continue and would you, would you going to continue and would still motivate outside action. Third is that there's all causes to the terrorists for to the terrorists. For for example, Israel is obviously still a state and is still and is still going to be a large strike of controversy within the Middle East among other countries. Meaning there's just a lot of all causes to this first contention that there's no reason why the affirmative will be able to solve for. Second is that they miss probably the best argument that we made on the second contention which is that there's an extreme which is the which is the which, which is that the diplomacy is just going to be negative they are trying to make this argument that diplomacy can that diplomacy can solve for the impacts they're talking about however they conceded out of the one and see that the united states is an imperial and colonial power meaning if they are imperial and colonial power even if they even if they remove military presence from the area there's no reason why the same coercive strategies wouldn't be used as to where there was presence in the region for example they would just use coercive economic strategies or other coercive foreign policies that would just result and many of the impacts that you were discussing. Your, the, the way you frame the 1AC is it's just a large discrepancy between the impacts the 1AC talks about and its solvency. There's no reason why they were able to solve for their impacts because one, there's many alternative causes and the United States is fundamentally motivated by the wrong things and the more wrong things and by self-interest which means they will just prepare which means even if you rule military presence there will be always be other reasons you can, all the reasons they can perpetuate this impacts which with that in mind let's move on to the negative case we're not going for the we're not going for the salamia argument so you can write that off your flow we're going for the hezbollah the hezbollah argument Extend the uniqueness, particularly of, of the of the Hezbollah contention. Tensions are very high now, following the Hamas attack on Israel and the war that has fallen its tracks. The United States has boasted has response has boasted its presence in the region to serve as a deterrent for Hezbollah entering the war. Military presence is working now as a deterrent, but the prospects of a wider regional war remain ever present. Hezbollah does not fear the Israeli military, but fears the consequences of a war with the United States. The forty the thirty four day war shows Hezbollah has been historically proven to miscalculate military strategies and often make decisions in haste. A wrong move on the current decision will be the devastating impacts in this region. Now let's discuss as to why they do link to this argument and to perpetuate the impacts we have discussed. On the link, reducing military presence gives Hezbollah an opening to launch an attack in Israel. Iran would use the crisis in Gaza as an excuse to cover up and break out of their non-proliferation agreement. 
Biden right now has an obligation to deter to, to, to Tehran from running nuclear weapons, but Iran may be looking to take advantage of Jerusalem for occupation with Hamas. Iran also has the, the, the materials to foster a nuclear weapon within a matter of two weeks and nearly a dozen within a matter of months. On the arguments that they made, they said we are missing an internal link bet be between military presence and Iran stepping in. However, the link chain that we have provided is clear. United States military removes their presence from the region. This gives Hezbollah an open window to to launch a wider scale war against against the Israeli state, and that leads to Iranian proliferation. You have to understand, and this is an argument that we made on the link. Iran, Hezbollah, these actors are not rational, and they have been known to act in haste many times, th th times throughout history. We already listed that. We already listed that example. Meaning, if you find, if you give, if you get, if you buy that that Hezbollah, that Hezbollah, the Hezbollah deterrence does distract Israel enough to potentially create the non-proliferation, that should be enough for you to buy this link chain. They say that the larger scale Middle East, Little Middle Eastern war is is. Eastern war isn't profitable. But think about it. If Iran, an enemy of many of the states in the region, would proliferate, this would cause widespread proliferation, which will obviously lead to widespread impacts. But independently, even if you do not buy that argument, one detonation of a nuclear bomb would still cause dramatic, drastic impacts that would affect millions of people. So the way you frame your ballot is that the affirmative is not able to resolve its impacts because of a massive discrepancy between solvency and impacts, and two is the magnitude of the, ne of, of the potential scenarios that the affirmative could wind itself in. The, the immense risk for a nuclear war that the affirmative move is not worth the risk of is not worth the risk of solving their impacts when they can barely prove they solve for them in the first place. For those reasons, I negate. All right, I'll take the rest of the Um, it's gonna be the AF, <coughs> like the AFK starting with oh, your elbow. <coughs> I don't want to get sick. Are you sick? No, I'm not sick. I'll kill you. <laughs> um, AFK starting with an overview, uh, and then the contention stuff, and then the neg. As a top-level framing issue to the round, even if the negative makes some compelling arguments in the 2NR, they severely miss the boat on what the actual crux of the 1AC position is. Under either framing, I will, we'll just link under utilitarianism, under either framing you should comfortably vote affirmative for a few reasons. Start on the contention one. Their biggest argument under contention one is that terrorists already exist, but they completely misunderstand the point of why terrorism exists. The 1AR has made an argument that the reason why terrorism is even a problem right now is because the United States has moved into the region and caused harm. They said that terrorism has existed for a long time. Guess what? U.S. military presence has existed for a long time, and that controls the link to terrorism in the first place. That means that even if there is a risk of an impact that, that like the, the negative is arguing, the AF controls the link because the risk of the impact derives from the United States being in the region in the first place. Even if the terrorists already exist, again, we solve the reason why terrorism <coughs> happens. They have conceded solvency evidence for why diplomacy and why the United States disengaging from the region decreases probable cause for terrorists to even launch attacks. Who are terrorists attacking, you might ask? The United States and their military presence, which means that the 1AC solves. Uh, that, that necessarily solves. They've also conceded the independent impact under the affirmative that says that if we continue the status quo, it results in millions of deaths in the Middle East, which outweighs because it's happening now versus a theoretical probability of nuclear war that they have done a really bad job explaining the internal link to in the 2NR. The second contention, though, 
They see that they, they see that diplomacy will be negative. There is zero warrant for why this is, and they have read zero scholarly evidence for why that's true. We have read and we will extend two pieces of one hour evidence at the bottom of the case that say that in fact diplomacy is key to solve, and diplomacy solves the root cause. That means that you're framing your ballot simply on risk of solvency from the affirmative. Contention two solves all of the negative because diplomacy is the way to approach a risk of explosion into war and death of civilians, which outweighs under util because we have a better chance of minimizing the risk of extinction. Now on to the NC. Here's the biggest problem with how they go for this Iran advantage. They have not won a single warrant for how or why this war happens in the first place. Even if Iran wants to proliferate, they are not winning that Iran will drop a nuclear weapon. Even if they win that nuclear weapons are bad, they are not winning the process in which nuclear weapons get dropped in the first place, which is a reason for you to presume affirmative. They have also conceded that Iran has no motivation or capability to go to war in general, which means that you should feel very skeptical voting on the impact because there's virtually no risk. That's evidence that was read in the 1AR. There's basically no link on this sort of argument in general, but but uh, argument in general. But second, they've conceded the argument that it's essentially non-unique because wars have always been happening in the Middle East, and it's it's virtually outdated. You are framing it because it's several years old, and their evidence for extinction is also several years old. You're voting affirmative because the AF controls the root cause. The reason why risk of war is happening is because the United States starts it, and then and then war between the war in the Middle East breaks out. They have conceded that there's no impact to war, which means the AF outweighs on probability and we you vote affirmative on risk of solvency that's the top of your ballot good debate good debate